Well, this morning I had ventured and thought about, well, maybe I'll talk about something else today rather than our big question series. Um, but I'm really the Holy Spirit has affected me in such a way to where I'm continuing on with the questions that have been asked. And in fact, it's become so um, profound to me what God is speaking that I am choosing to actually go into next week into this same topic. And besides the fact, there are so many questions that continue to come in on this topic. So we're talking about the end times, and everybody has such a fascination with it. And I have always been very um, expositorial with my approach to the end times because I believe that sometimes we can, it's like demons and doorknobs type of thing. You know, we get so preoccupied with something, we make something out of nothing. Um, but, you know, all the more that I see in our world today, Jesus is coming soon. And I don't know if, if the church is ready. I don't know if, the, I certainly know the world isn't ready. Um, and I think there are things that we need to be aware of. So I'm tackling another question, but let's look at the questions we've had so far. Um, here's some things we've learned. Although God hates divorce, he gives his grace when people uh, remarry and, and will provide renewed hope for couples and families as they follow Christ. Amen. Uh, we're all missionaries. We learned that in a topic, uh, one submitted questions. Our relationship with people is important. <clears throat> we're called to be generous with our time, money, and affection. Hell was created for Satan and demons. God does not send people to hell. People choose that when they reject Christ. Uh, Pastor Pete did a great job with that. I have another slide here. And here's what we've been on lately, the prophecy questions. And there's, uh, there's more, but I'm going to try to deal with some of them and culminate this next week. Um, I'd like to preach about the end times, what's coming next in prophecy. We talked a lot about that. We talked about the huge uh, trillions of uh, cubic meters of natural gas that has recently been found off of Israel's shores and um, the contract that Energen has with, uh, and I've always wondered why Russia would attack Israel. I mean, I just don't understand that. And more and more, I mean, there's always been signs of the times, right? There's always been earthquakes and famines and everything, but never in the history of the world has Israel also existed and come from all the world, brought back to their nation. They've brought, been brought back from Persia, um, and they were scattered by Titus, but in AD 70, but not since AD 70 have they been a nation until 1948. So the generation that sees the beginning of the end will see the end. What is the difference between judgment, seed of Christ, and the great white throne judgment? Well, here we are today. The judgments, judgments. Oh, what a joyous topic. <laughs> we are just looking forward to this, aren't we? So 1 Corinthians 3, Revelation 20, if you want to have your fingers there. When I was a young man in high school, in junior high, I won various awards. How many won or got a ribbon at something? I mean, maybe, I'm sure you did. Well, one of my most proud things and proud moments was I received this Louis Armstrong Jazz Award. I play a myriad of band instruments and one of them very well. Uh, well, I used to. Uh, you know, so put that in the past. That's a long time ago. Um, but, I, you know, we would have these stage band things and we'd pay... We play Glenn Miller and um, some Dixieland, and we, you know, we play all this um, Pennsylvania six five oh 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 ba da ba ba da ba 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 tequila ba 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 ba. Now you know it's all that stuff. So um, when I was in school, I won this award. I was so happy. And um, how many have won an award? I mean, you've won an award. You know what that's like. Well, the Bible says that we're all going to be given awards. Um, the same is going on in heaven with God. We're given rewards by God according to our service. And I've always wondered about this, and I'm, I'm sure many of you have too, because this question has been introduced about the judgments. Um, God would judge people fairly, wouldn't you think? I mean, God is a just God, and he judges fairly, and he gives to those who... who perform a certain way, I suppose, or not. And I'm not getting into the fact that salvation is about performance. We're not going there. Salvation is not about your performance. It's about God's grace alone. But there seems to be some that are worse in life and sin, you would say, right? You would say Jeffrey Dahmer and what he did was significantly worse than the little boy who stole a candy bar from the store. There's a big difference in our justice or our sense of justice between one who eats people and kills them between one who um, stole a candy bar so should they be punished the same 
What if they both don't believe in Jesus? And don't misunderstand, I'm not going into the, the Mormon or the purgatory idea where there's levels of hell or there's levels of heaven. That is unbiblical. I don't believe that, of course. Um, we're not going there. But the Bible actually, honestly, really does talk about different levels of reward and punishment. Did you realize this? This is something that we need to really, I think, examine because they are dealt with in the judgments. Uh, we know that we're saved by grace through faith. Uh, again, I want to just make that clear. You cannot earn your salvation. You are not good enough, pretty enough. You can't perform enough. You can't give enough money. You, 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 you just can't be good enough. You can't n not curse. You cannot, you know, not r smoke and chew and run with them that do. You, you just can't do good things enough. You know, you just can't be on the board, save one day, you know, on the board the next, and teaching Sunday school the next. You can't do everything. The Bible says in Ephesians 2, for it is by grace you're saved through faith, not because of you, yourself, and you, um, but because of what God has done. Because if you could do that, you would boast. And you can't do that. So, so salvation is not by works. It's not by what we do. But we, we have to learn, though, to distinguish between our belief and our behavior. Okay, catch those two words. Our belief and our behavior. And the difference is this. And I want to say where I got this from. Because there was a, a gal. Has anybody ever heard of Opal Redden? No, no from years ago. Um, AGTS, um, Assembly of God Theological Seminary, Central Bible College. Um, she was a precious saint of God, and she taught this once in a chapel, and I'll never forget it. She said this and, and backed it up with the Bible, which I'm planning to do today. She said, I, our belief determines where we will spend eternity. And secondly, our behavior will determine how we spend eternity. Our belief determines where we will spend eternity. Our behavior will determine how we spend eternity. We know that we go to heaven because we believe in Jesus. But believing is important, right? Believing is the key. The Bible tells us clearly, Jesus says, that he who believes in the Son has life. It's by believing. In fact, the Roman scripture that we often quote, Romans 10, 9, and 10, um, if you confess your sins, uh, or, or it says um, to believe in Jesus, basically, that we confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. The, the oversimplification of the verse is that, that we lead people in a prayer and say, repeat this prayer after me because if you confess it with your mouth, you're saved. But it's not, that's not what it's saying. Paul is saying that if you believe in your heart, you're going to confess. You're going to speak it out. You're going to say it. So leading a person in a prayer it, it is really inconsequential compared to what they really believe. Because somebody can say what they believe and not really believe it. Belief is important. So believing changes us. So our behavior determines how many rewards and the degrees of responsibility that we'll get in heaven. And I'm going to prove that in just a minute. And, and your treasure will have to be in heaven. And you need treasure in heaven because Jesus says to store it for yourselves, treasures in heaven. He didn't say store it for yourselves, uh, for your Father in heaven. We're not going to have to send up things to God so he can finish the streets of gold. And he doesn't, ha he doesn't need a fund that he's trying to raise for the, the roof <laughs> over the sidewalk out here that's falling apart. Praise God, we have the money. It's still in your pockets, but we got the money, right? <clears throat> Hey, we need some more money for the streets of gold, so pray some more, be better, act gooder, be bestest, whatever you can do, be holiest, and so that we can make more deposits for God. It doesn't say that, it says store for yourself. Store up for yourself, treasure in heaven. Our belief determines where we go, but our behavior determines how much responsibility and treasure, the meaning of that word is very important will have in heaven. Remember the parable of the talents? I mean, the one guy just hit his, right? But what does Jesus say that the Father does for those that take what they have and they, you know, they multiply it? He entrusts them with more treasure. The one with ten, ten more. The one with five, he's in charge of five cities. It may shock some of us because that's not the impression we get from culture of what heaven is, really, is it? It's a perfect earth and a perfect heaven. Someone is, is, is going to be the mayor in heaven. Someone is going to be leaders 
Someone's going to have responsibilities. I don't think we ever perceive it this way. It's like we're all sitting on clouds with little harps and little fat cherubs playing. And, and this is the image that we get. It's a Hollywood inbred um, type of doctrine, and it's not true. Your, be your behavior determines um, how you'll spend eternity, whether you're a believer or, or an unbeliever. Don't misunderstand, I'm not speaking again about salvation. I can't say this enough during this message. It's really important. <clears throat> salvation is not about your behavior. Works do not determine where you spend eternity, but they will determine how you spend eternity. And if, if that wasn't a shocker enough, if we've uh, carefully examined hell, we find that there are different degrees of punishment doled out in hell. Here's what we need to understand where the two judgments are in Scripture. We find the great... Uh, judgment seat of Christ and the great white throne judgment. So we have the judgment seat of Christ and the great white throne judgment. At the judgment seat of Christ, every person is a believer. At the judgment seat of Christ, every person um, is getting judged for what they've done. At the great white throne judgment is for unbelievers. The great white throne judgment is not a determination of whether you spend eternity in heaven or hell. It's too late at that point. Hell is Hell is determined. It is the judgment. And you determine it yourself. People in earth, the Bible says that they decide this by rejecting Christ. Um, it's very interesting. Early this morning, about 5.45, I was sitting in um, the restaurant that I go to often. And I was sitting there and talking to the gal. And the restaurant just opens. I mean, they open just so, so some police officers can come in. There's always a group of police officers that sit there, um, Tacoma police, uh, whatever. So I'm sitting there, and this gal helps me every morning, and I just get protein. I get eggs and bacon, and that's just pretty much it. And she, <coughs> she's talking, and I said, so what is, what is the, the truth then? Because I said, you know, I hear you in the restaurant. Your voice carries, and she's a, she's a very gregarious gal. And I said, you know, you, when you you are, are pick up on people who are lying like that. I've heard you with your coworkers. You just nail them. I mean, you always say, that's not true, or that's not right, or I hear you. The whole restaurant hears you. She says, yeah, I know. My voice travels. I said, yeah, it does. <laughs> I said, but, so what is truth? What is, and I'm trying to plant these seeds, right? So comparatively. And she said, well, it's just whatever you believe. And that's the idea that is in the world. That there is no basis or bottom line for what is true. And as two weeks ago we pointed out last week, the significance of prophecy being fulfilled in the Bible always and 100% identifies to its veracity. That this book that you hold and what saying is happening and coming is actually happening and coming. That Jesus is returning. And friends, it's very near. But at that point, someone makes a decision at the great white throne judgment. The Bible says it's appointed to man once to die and then the judgment. So whatever they believed, no matter if it was true to them or not, it was a lie. A lot of people believe what they think is true. Young people do this all the time. Listen to me, young people. Tobias, Hannah. People will believe a lie all the time. Just because everybody and every one of your friends says it's true, it's not true. They're all liars. If it doesn't compare with the Word of God, they're lying. And you have compassion on them because you know the truth. And this is so predominant in our culture, friends. I, I wept for my boys when they were younger, and still today, that they are inheriting a world that doesn't look, and those of you who love America, and you look at what's going on in America, the rest of the world is shaking their hands literally, for, shaking their heads literally. They're looking at us and going, you people don't even know if you're a boy or a girl. They are just, they are just like, I cannot believe Americans are so insane and that your politicians are pushing the agenda. I mean, what rational adult. Look at Canada, friends. If the signs of the times aren't relevant here, just look at Canada. It's falling apart. The significance of the truth and what is true is being undermined with lies. And people are buying it because we're affirming it started a long time ago in my generation of the 80s with this uh, self-esteem idea. We're not supposed to encourage self-esteem. We're supposed to encourage self-acceptance of God's design. That's what we do. 
I had many a young person in my youth groups over the years that have uh, girls who thought that they were ugly or, or because they didn't compare. They would look in the pages of a magazine, and, and they, or back then it was magazines, right? We didn't have this. Or, I love my MTV. You know, that was the thing, right? Those of you in the 80s, you remember those boxes we had? They were televisions. They were this deep and this big. <laughs> and the world was telling them what they thought had to be true. This is how you're supposed to look. This is how you're pretty. And they had all these little by nose is too big or, or that, or I'm too fat or I'm too skinny, I'm too tall, and, and all of these things. And these girls would just, they would, and I said, listen, self-esteem is stupid. I'm not going to affirm whether you think you're a boy when you're a girl. What I'm going to do is say, hey, God made you with these things. They are not imperfections. They're God's design for your body. That's the truth. There are ten unchangeable. Well, I, you know, I'm not going to get that. So both works are judged at the, at the great white throne judgment and the judgment seat of Christ. The judgment seat of Christ for the believer, let's talk first about the judgment seat of Christ, where God judges the believer's work. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 10, the scripture says, According to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another builds on it. But let each man, or let each one take heed how he builds on it. I want to take a look at our works before we go deeper into the uh, judgment seat of Christ. The works are important. Paul says there is no foundation except for Christ. So it's clear, he said, hey, if the, the someone else comes along and builds on it, um, the building there is a polis, but it's not, it's you. You're not, I'm not the one building on the foundation. The foundation is Jesus. You are building on it. And how you build on the foundation of your belief in Christ is very important. Look what he says in verse 12. If anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, and precious stones, wood, hay, straw. So we understand gold, right? We understand silver, precious stones. Uh, but the interesting part is when we turn the corner to wood, we turn the corner to wood, hay, or straw, what do these have in common? They will all burn. <laughs> They're all flammable. So they burn up because there's a fire coming. And Paul kind of prophesies about this. This is important because the fire is coming for who? The believer. Look at who he's writing to. The, the significant authorship of Paul in this letter is to the believers in Corinth, in the church, he is writing to those who believe in Jesus. And he is saying, take heed, take care how you build upon your faith in Christ Jesus. Take care of who you're listening to. Take care of what you're putting into your theology. Take care of what deeds you're doing based on who you're following. Take care of the things you say. Take care of how you're living your life based upon the foundation of Christ. That is immovable. You are saved. You're all Christians. And I can't hardly believe that. I mean, these Corinthians, they're having sex in the foyer. They're getting drunk in the communion wine. They're just, I mean, he calls them out in their orgies and their, and their, their filth, right? These people, and he calls them believers. I'm like, Paul... Come on, wake up, it's the modern era. In other words, he's saying there is a foundation, but how you're building on it is wrong. Look at what he says in verse 13. Each one's work will become clear. So there's a quality of the work. For the day, the day, the day of judgment will declare it because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss. Notice he'll receive a reward. But he himself will be saved, yet so as through the fire. In other words, I'm getting to heaven just by the skin of my teeth. But that seems to be the posture of some. Like, yeah, I believe in Jesus, but I'm going to do whatever I want. I'm going to live however I want. I'm just going to do whatever I want as I please because I don't care. Every believer will be judged for the work we do while we're here on the earth. Notice 
that the work is tested with fire. He doesn't lose his salvation. It says right there that he himself will be saved. The fire is for the work, and the work is rewarded with eternal rewards, he says. You will be rewarded. Your work matters. Your works matter. You can be a believer and do works for temporary things, or you can do works for eternal things. The things you do for now will only be for now. And the things that we do for eternity will last. So you'll receive reward for the things you did of eternal value, but you will not receive reward for the things you did for temporary value. When um, we were in Kenya, I on this campus, and this campus is amazing. Remember all the houses and the kids and the students, the orphans in each home. There's 20 kids in each house. Each house has a house parent with their own children and an auntie that lives in the home. And what was so amazing about there's this just kind of closed environment of, of several acres where they raise their own chickens and all this stuff, right? They grow their own food. They pump their own water and filter it. And inside this, these walls, there is this environment of seeking God, pressing in, loving Jesus. Everything is about learning to work, learning to serve one another. And in that environment, it's like a taste of heaven, you know what you see that you don't see or what you hear, what you don't hear is singing everywhere. They're just walking around singing. They're singing songs to the Lord. They're rejoicing in song. They're lifting up the Lord in song. It's like everywhere, and it's like, this is just not America. I can't wait to get to heaven. This morning, when we were singing those songs, the Holy Spirit was just zapping me. And I, I was just so moved by the significance of who Jesus is and what he has done for me. And When I think about investing in eternity, all the stuff I can earn and do and perform and do here pales in comparison, friend, to the joy and the peace and the liberation that there is in knowing and serving Christ. Look at what Jesus says in Matthew 6, 1. Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, you'll have no reward from your Father in heaven. Wow. Our motives will determine the value of our investment. No reward, he says. No reward. In other words, the only reward you get for doing or serving with your, the motivation of being judged by the people that are seeing you and I do what we do has no value for eternity whatsoever. If we're not doing it for Christ, if our motivation, our motivations will be judged. And that's scary because nobody can see your motivation or mine. I mean, we can put on a good face. We're good actors. In verse 2 of chapter 6 in Matthew, Jesus says, Therefore, when you do your charitable deeds, do not stand, sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But when you do charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deed may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward himself openly. These are good things to do. Our church does some events that do this. We, we give even though we know that no one will probably come to church because of it. We give because, you know, we just give. Some things we do, we do because it's a principle of Scripture. Do not let your let land know what your right is doing. We do it just to bless people, whether they're believers or not. That's important. We, we're called to serve. But more importantly in the scripture, Jesus is talking about the significance of the Father. Now, this is powerful because it says, and your Father. Can we put that up, last part up there again? And your Father, who sees in secret, will himself. God himself, the Father himself, you in the Father's presence will hand you. I think it's preaching itself. This is a powerful concept. The reward isn't given through some office. It comes down through a series of angels, through a bunch of red tape, and finally makes its way to the person who's supposed to present it. It's not like going to the tax office. It's not like going to the DMV for sure. <laughs> Here, take a number, 
and when you get to your number, you're called, and we're going to give you your reward. You're, you're going to, the Bible says, friends, meet the Father himself. And he will distribute that. We are his workmanship created for good works, the Bible says. Not by good works, for good works. 1 John 2, 28. And now little children abide in him, that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Not be ashamed. Wow. In other words, there's a moment of shame. Well, when Christ appears, everyone will see what you were really made of. Praise God you made it to heaven by the skin of your teeth. Why would the believer need to be ashamed? Because he has not been working for Christ, but rather himself. So there's the judgment seat of Christ. Then there's the great white throne judgment. Now, let's look at the unbeliever. The great white throne judgment, everyone is an unbeliever. Revelation 20, verse 11 says, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away. <laughs> Can't even see his face. The power of God. And there was found no place for them. Verse 12. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. Watch these words carefully. Watch them carefully. And books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. Notice where the books are open. These books are the works of the unbelievers. This is the works of the things that they did and why they are judged and what they were judged for is in them. The book of life is opened to see if their names are already written. So that's the purpose of the book of life. But the other books contain the information about what they did in this life. In other words, the book of life is the book of grace. The Bible gives us the verb, only the verb, of the term the name can be blotted out. For those of you that ask the eternal security question, there it is. I got a couple of them. This is an amazing sight. It's very vivid. It has so many angles. I see a table and books laying there and the books being opened by those who are helping with the judgments. And the book of life is open. And then it goes on. And the dead were judged according to their works. By the things which were written in the books. Verse 13. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And everyone and anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So there are degrees... For the believer, we learn of reward. Wouldn't you think a just judge would have degrees of punishment as well? This is going to mess with some of your theology. Now, don't shoot me. Um, we saw that for the believer, the judgment seat of Christ, we're rewarded for what God has done. Jesus said, what you've done to the least of these, you've done, done it to me. We serve. So the guy that believes in Jesus, that never shares his faith, he never spends time in the Word, he never reads his Bible, except on Sundays when he's forced to, he never gives generously, he's not faithful to God's house, which is something God's called him to do, doesn't pursue holy living as God would have him do, will receive the same rewards as the guy who prays, spends his time in the Word, Ties faithful, loves God's house, and pursues living holy. Will they receive the same rewards? The answer is no. The Bible says they'll be in heaven, but they will not receive the same rewards. So then the guy that does not believe in Jesus, maybe he's a good person, but he's agnostic, defiantly rejects God, doesn't believe in God, rejects Jesus, says, I'm not going to give my life to God, but he's a good person. He has a family, uh, goes to work, 
Maybe they're a young person in the family. They go to school. Uh, their, their family, all their family is believers, but they reject Christ. So they go to hell, separated from their family. Will he receive the same punishment that Hitler will? Who killed 6 million Jews and 5 million other people, 11 million people? First of all, who am I to judge? But I know from the character of God that he's a just judge. Come on now. He's a just judge. This is not levels of purgatory or things. I'm not teaching that. Levels that God gives of reward and levels of punishment. He's going to give, he's going to judge every person individually, just like he judges every single one of us. The Father directly gives us rewards on how that they live. At the great right throne judgment, it matters how you live. And we go to heaven because we believe. We go to hell because we don't believe. That's a powerful thing. That just Doesn't that burden your heart? Knowing that the grace of God is available for all who would believe, and yet there's people who don't believe. This is our missional drive. This is our missional calling. And people that you know, you know them, right? You go to work with them. You live with them. They're your family members. They seem so indifferent to God. It doesn't matter. Or they're so, and it just breaks your heart, right? I mean, it breaks my heart. I wonder how people can escape knowing Jesus. I don't know how they live without him. I don't know how they go on without him, facing him every morning or, or getting to hear his word or worship. Or, I don't know how they live. God is not a crutch. He's a stretcher. Matthew eleven twenty. 20. Jesus. Then he began to rebuke the, the cities in which most of his mighty works had been done. So here's Jesus. He had done all these miracles and things in these cities. And he's judging them. And he says, why? Because they did not repent... Verse 21, catch this, friends. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Tyre and Sidon were well known for tormenting the prophets and idol worship. Verse 22, but I say to you, it will be more tolerable, more tolerable, those words mean less suffering, for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. Verse 23, and you Capernaum who are exalted in heaven will be brought down to the Hades, for if the mighty works which were done uh, and you have been done in Sodom. Now, notice this next phrase again. It would have remained to this day. In other words, they would have repented, uh, and my father would have destroyed it. Sodom would be here today if they had seen that what you have done. Verse 24, But I say to you that it shall be more tolerable, less suffering, for Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. Have you considered the gravity of Jesus' words here, friends? The significance of punishment is because God is a just God and he punishes wickedness. But he is just in that he is not going to punish people the same. It seems apparent. This is amazing. It's more tolerable? It will be more tolerable? I mean, hell is still not pretty. Oh, I'm glad, I'm a good person, but I'm going to go to hell. I'm going to be shoveling coal. But man, it's just, what a stupid ignoramus thing to say. They heard the message and rejected it. Americans. These places heard the message and rejected it. They mocked the prophets. They made fun of them. Everything else was more important. The elevation of, purpose, of personal person and self-esteem and all that was made to be greater than God. Worshiping the created rather than the creator who is to be praised forevermore. Amen. Look at the more tolerable. 
In other words, those who were in church and heard the message and rejected Jesus, the judgment against them will be worse for you than Sodom and Gomorrah. I can't believe Jesus is saying these words. This, this messes with my psyche. My brain's rattled. I'm having some attempts of grasping these ideas. Well, pastor, I'm not like Sodom. Many can say because they don't, they're not, Sodom was destroyed because of sexual sin and abomination or sexual perversion of homosexuality and lust. But the primary sin was not that. Ezekiel chapter 16 tells us what the primary sin was and why God judged it so harshly. Ezekiel 16 verse 49. Behold, this was the guilt of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters had pride, excessive food, and prosperous ease, but did not aid the poor and needy. They were haughty and did an abomination before me, so I removed them when I saw it. The sin of Sodom is pride. The sin of Sodom is an arrogance that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. It is agnostic and atheistic in our contemporary terms. It is that place where pride rises up so much in a person that they worship themselves. They worship how they look. They worship the, the people that they hang out with. They worship their circumstances. They worship their wealth. They worship all of the stuff about them more than God. The same sin was the sin of Lucifer. Pride says, I will never surrender my will to God. I will reject authority as long as I can. Because I want my things and my way. And I will never accept the sacrifice of Jesus. Just like my friend early this morning. It's my truth. What does Matthew say here that they saw and they still rejected? What did they see? God's works. They saw God's works. They saw God's good works. Friends, hear me in this. It will be more suffering, more tolerable. I think that if we were to say this in every church, in every corner, in every block of America, it's more tolerable for Sodom than the woman or man or child or teenager that sits in the congregation every week and rejects Jesus. Well, that's what we learned uh, uh, two weeks ago, right? That those who hear it during this time of grace before the rapture, God himself will send them a strong delusion so they'll believe the lie and will not receive the truth. It is more tolerable for them then watch this. Paul writes to the church in Rome. He t talks about unbelievers in Rome, Romans chapter 2, verse 5. But in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath rather than good things in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Treasuring up. Believers are at the judgment seat of Christ Unbelievers at the great white throne judgment, and they're treasuring up both of them, some for wrath, some for reward. This is the significance of the sacrifice of Jesus, that he loves us and gave himself for us and extends, extends toward us all mankind his grace. And when it's rejected, it actually stores up the wrath of God. I know this. When a doctor gives you a good report, you like it. But if he's being deceitful and I tell you that you're going to die in five days, he's not a good doctor. A true report, an assessment of your condition, even though you may not like it, is what you want. Why is this important? Because there's a lot of believers in the world, in life, and they believe in Jesus, and they're going to heaven, but refuse to live and to store up for themselves good stuff. If you go down that road and, friends, you and I, we think that we can just do whatever we will with, and ignore the principles of God's word, we, we get so lazy with this thing. We, you know, this is the truth about prophecy, too. Let the reader understand. I mean, we're instructed to know about the end. We're instructed to, to understand these things as believers and to, to know the word. And I want to be like the Bereans, Right? They searched the scriptures to know if what these guys were saying was true. I mean, they, they looked for hints and clues and details. 
We know this of the, the Magi when they came to visit uh, Jesus, right? They were scholars that searched the Hebrew scriptures. Remember the whole taking over the Persians, taking over Babylon who had already captured the Jews and, and these are Persian guys and all of a sudden they're searching the Hebrew Bible because they knew that this, this story about this woman named Esther and what God did and these, these th three Hebrew children in the fire furnace, they knew the stories. They knew about this guy named Daniel from the Hebrew Bible and they understood the count of history. And they had searched the scriptures for the star so they could follow. Then they saw the sign in the heaven and they came to the place where the baby was. We are called to be no more in depth than that. All the more. That God has given us the wealth and riches of his grace by just giving us his word. Which in spite of Harry Potter is still the best selling book of all time. A doctor you want to tell you the truth. Believing in Jesus changes, friends, us, doesn't it? It changes our drives. It changes our life. He changes our wants and desires. I'm not trying to scare us. Well, maybe I am a little bit. I'm, I'm like the doctor, though, this morning, and I want to tell us the truth. And when we read these scriptures, maybe we just skip by them when we look at this or that. It's like a smorgasbord when you go to the uh, buffet. You get all the bad stuff for you, right? <laughs> when I was a kid... I got in some fights, <clears throat> and one of them, I was going to get in a fight in Townsend, and my dad intervened, but this is the way it went down. I was, I was going to fight with this kid, and uh, we made a plan to go behind the drugstore, um, which was kind of catty corner across the street from the Coast to Coast store. I know the town like the back of my hand. I rode my bike down every street and alley, but that's what I didn't have, no internet. <laughs> I mean, I... I made Amy lay down and jump over ditches. I mean, I just, my Schwinn with my red banana seat, man, that was the bomb. Sissy bars all the way, yeah. <laughs> and I'll never forget, I got something at school, something stupid. You know, I, I was in eighth grade, I think, and we had a plan, so I went, met him behind there and went to the back, and he reluctantly showed up. I didn't know, he was more nervous, and I was kind of scared to death, but I was going to keep my word. And I was walking down the sidewalk to go back there, and Dad worked at the Coast to Coast Star. He fixed lawn mowers and guns, and he built churches <laughs> and pastored them, did everything. So he saw me, he said, hey, where are you going? I said, I'm going to fight this kid. And so he kind of put his tongue in his cheek like this. He walked down the sidewalk, he saw the other kid, he said, come on out here. Come down to the diner, I'll buy you guys a, sh a milkshake. <laughs> that was all it took. We were playing video games that afternoon together, right? <laughs> the arcade. Star Castle. <laughs> when I think about that fight and that battle, it was alleviated by the intervention of my earthly father. We have a heavenly father who wants to intervene in our circumstances. If we turn to John chapter 6 and verse... 26. Well, before we get to there, I want to finish with this, but the, the context is this. Jesus has just fed the 5,000 and with five loaves and two fish. An amazing miracle, right? So the people are following him. Jesus even gets on the boat, crosses the lake, and then they all find boats. They get over there. Ha, huh, we didn't even see you leave. Where'd you go? And verse number 26, he says, Jesus answered them and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me not because of the signs but because you ate the loaves and were filled. Do not labor for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set a seal on him. Then they said to him, What shall we do that we may do the works of God? Verse 29, Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God. Here's how we work for God. You ready for it? That you believe in him whom he sent. So two things. How do we do that? One, we invest by trusting Jesus with our whole life. That's believing on him. This is the work. Your whole life. Jesus isn't for 10% of you. He's not just for you when you're at church. He's for with you when, you, with you when you're with your friends. Oh, we don't have friends anymore. Excuse me, when we're on our phones. Let me say that. Jesus is even with you, those of you who are on your phones a lot. I know that's hard to believe, but he is. 
It sounds simple enough. What does that mean, believing? Believing is more than a simple prayer, like I said earlier, in saying the right words. We've got to believe. I believe in Pam, my wife, not for salvation, but for illustration purposes, her as a person, her character, her person, her person toward me. Those of you who know her know she's outstanding. What, a, what she believes is important to our family. How she has instructed and corrected our children has been important to me. I value her. I trust her with my deepest secrets. She's a person that I tell everything and anything to. Sometimes when the kids are in a room and, and there's a discussion going on and they look, they don't think that we know what we're talking about, we know what we're talking about. I want to do things for her because of that. I, I want to make her happy. I want to be faithful. I want to provide. I want to share experiences with her in life. Because I met her, she changed my life. Her influence has changed my direction in life at times. And her words have brought comfort when I have been in dis dis disarray or distraught. I, uh, when I have failed, she serves me and I serve her. But this is what separates Jesus from all other religions and all other dogmas of the world. We believe in the risen, personal, living Jesus. We have a relationship with that person. We have an intimacy that we want to grow. We're inspired by his thoughts and what he thinks about us and the world. We're captivated by his love and drawn in by that. We are led by his Holy Spirit that he gives us for this life. When you came to Christ, did you feel this love? Did you feel that kind of intimacy? Did you sense that kind of relationship? Friends, that is what Christ offers. That is the God who he is. And number two, how do we believe in Jesus, do the work of God? Invest by living to honor him. I've been in situations where I've been in such temptation as a young man. One time in a band, on a band tour. Our band went on big tours, a couple of them. And went down to California. I, play, I, be, I played in Disneyland in the parade. Our stage band played on a stage. I mean, we did all this stuff, right? And that one night in the motel room, some of the kids were goofing around. I was, in, I was tired, so we had to share beds, you know. A girl, girls came into our room. I was asleep. A girl in a bikini got in my bed, brushing up against me. Now, what would a young man do in that situation? What should he do? Right. Not only had my youth pastor scared me to death with the diseases I could catch, <laughs> more importantly, I thought this will not bring honor to Jesus. Believing in Jesus is what saved you. Your faith is activated by God's grace. He, believing in Jesus creates opportunities to invest in eternity just by following him. But pastor, we're saved by grace. Yes, we are, not by works. John 6, 20 said, here is the work of God, to believe in the one whom he sent. Do you invest in the kingdom of God with your time? Do you spend time with Jesus? Do you get to know him? Do you invest time in the kingdom with your affection, your worship, and your giving? We're called to set our affection on things above, not things on the earth. Do you invest in the kingdom with your tithes? Do you, gi do you give uh, when... You, you, giving money won't get you to heaven. But it connects you with God because you're honoring him with your wealth. Do you invest in the kingdom by serving others? Do you participate by investing in the kingdom by being involved with the family of God like we're doing today? What we're doing today, eating burgers, that's worship. <laughs> it is. It is a form of worship, glorifying God with one another, enjoying one another. I have been guilty of of building with wood, hay, and stubble in my life at times. I admit, and I'm sure you have too, we're just all the same. We're all human. But have you invested in your eternal home? Are you storing up for yourselves treasures in heaven? I asked Pam to come. And the glorious thing about storing up for ourselves treasures in heaven, the Bible says it never corrupts. It never fades. It's not like your investment. You go to the bank, you're saving up for that next motorcycle. And, um, you know, because the motorcycle money has to stay with the motorcycle money, or on the, if you're married anyway. Um, 
<coughs> and uh, you realize that all of that that you're saving up can bring you honor and it can bring you joy. God doesn't give us stuff to make us unhappy, but do you glorify God with that? You're the best of you. I used to say all the time, give God your microwave oven. In other words, every little thing you don't even think about. Give him glory next time you put in that gross frozen burrito. Because he knows he's your child, you're his child. And praise God, we want to do that, don't we? Thank you for watching Abundant Life Church. If you found this teaching helpful, please subscribe to our page and share us with a friend. Also, please consider giving at nwlife.org.